Kendall. And John. And we're the Antonelli's of Antonelli's Cheese Shop in Austin, Texas. And we are here with you Woo! today for a cheese and chocolate course. So excited. So before we get started, if your plate doesn't look like some version of this and you still have everything wrapped up in bulk and in bundles and bars, we suggest you just pause right here Go watch the quick plating video and set it all up. That way when you're tasting as a tasting, you get to just sit down and relax and eat. And, and you're not like fumbling with wrappers and which one is it and all that. So watch the plating video because right now we are ready to go. And we have our first cheese at 12 o'clock, our first chocolate at 12 o'clock. And we know that it goes around clockwise according down our menus. Um, and we're going to just relax and have fun. So we are so excited to be with you for this next what, 45, 50 minutes. Um, we'll see how long I talk. In your box, you would have gotten this awesome envelope here. Um, and also this great sensory guide document here with some tips and tricks, along with some uh, tasting flavor wheel. We highly encourage you keep it nearby. Uh, there'll be a lot of great things that you can reference back to. Uh, so we've got ours here off to the side. Yeah, and so, um, what are we doing? We're doing cheese and chocolate. This is the third edition that we've done. So this is, was actually an early pandemic pivot for us. And as far as we know, we're the first people to do it. Um, and it's an on-demand tasting experience. So do we host live classes that you can join us and hire us for live events? Absolutely. Um, but this is so that you can do it on your own whenever you want it. You can enjoy the goodies on their own or do this guided tasting with us. And so not only do we have cheese and chocolate, and we switch it up quarterly, but we also have a charcuterie, so a cured meats and cheese. We have a cheese 101, and then John's, one of your favorites, well, this is also your favorite, is a cheese and honey class. So if any of those appeal to you, we'd love for you to gift us, send us, take all of our classes and give us feedback. But most importantly, tasting time. That's right, well, you have your glass of wine. Should anybody else yeah, get a beverage, so let's, perhaps? Let's talk mise en place. If we were cooking, mise en place means what all do you have in order and ready to go for you to set up your station. For us, it means, is our mise en place ready to taste? So for me, that means I've got my plate of goodies, I've got my menus, I have a spreader, although we also say wash your hands if you want because we want you to touch it and get in there and get, it's a cheese and chocolate class, y'all. You gotta get in there. This, um, is, this is sexy, this is sexy. I'm so excited. <laughs> Welcome to our lives, y'all, the lives of food-focused people. Okay, uh, John and I always have sparkling water. Sparkling water is a great palate cleanser. Um, cheese is heavy and dense, and actually so is chocolate, and so the effervescence of bubbles just picks all those fats up off your palate and washes them down and clears your palate sort of to go back for the next one. So um, we always have sparkling water. Usually I say, if you're gonna drink wine, start with like a sparkling white or rosé, um, something dry, maybe a little sweet if you want it, but I like dry for the first three or four, and then you could move into like a Pinot Noir or a lighter medium bodied red. Um, just know if you go for a big full bodied red, it will overpower and mask some of the flavor, but if that's the way you wanna enjoy it, then go for it. Um, I am drinking a medium red blend um, for here, sourced from Texas. So I'm just going for it tonight and I'm gonna have my red wine. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're drinking or you're eating at night, in the morning, middle of the day. Whenever. This is your treat to yourself. So enjoy it how you want. If you're also a beer lover or cider lover, that's great for these two. And basically as you're deciding, or cocktails, as you're deciding your pairings though, just know that the first ones are generally better because um, they're younger, that these are younger cheeses, they're better with lighter profile beverages. And then in the middle to the end, you can move to more heavier, darker aged yeah, perfect. beverages. That sounds perfect. Okay, we got all that. The only other thing is like some guidelines for enjoyment. I would say stick with us if you can. Um, it's easy to skip ahead, but if you do, that will, I won't say mess up your palate, but it's gonna jump your, if you all of a sudden eat the blue cheese, you're only gonna taste blue the whole rest of the tasting. So try to stay with us, save a little bit back of each tasting because we always want you to mix and match and see what other combinations work. And we want you to always finish on your favorite bite. So if you don't like the last bite we give you, then you can go back gonna, and finish on your favorite You get bite. to choose um, because <laughs> all of our palates are different. So it's really exciting and flavorful to Kendall and I will be quite different from you perhaps. Um, and so one of the things that we're gonna do is just quickly calibrate our palates, get everybody thinking about the tasting moments, the tasting experiences. There's a lot going on out there and out in life. So we are here to just center ourselves 
yeah. and our palettes over the next 45 minutes together. Totally. Okay. And so we're going to start with, what I want you to do is pick up one of your uh, Piedras de Lunas. It's what's prepared with your seventh cheese. Uh, you might not know what Lunas is yet, which is what's exciting about don't this. Don't eat this if you're allergic to nuts. Yes. Don't eat this if you're allergic to nuts. <laughs> Um, what I want you to do is pinch your nose and then take a bite of the Piedras de Lunas and chew on it. Pay attention to what's happening on your tongue. You'll feel the texture, but you'll go maybe get some sweetness, maybe a little umami or bitterness. And when you're like, oh man, I know exactly what this thing is, release your nostril and exhale out through the back of your nose. And you cool. should get like a super cool I have not experience. done that with the Piedras de Luna. I thought okay. it would be super oh, fun for this. And so what we're doing is we're isolating <laughs> the taste buds on your tongue and the olfactory um, because really what we believe is that taste plus aroma equals flavor. And that's because our olfactory stores thousands and thousands of taste memories ever since we were little kids. Um, the foods we were raised with, all of those sort of memories were stored through the aromas uh, of the experience. Your tongue picks up salt, Sweet, sour, bitter, and umami. That's, that's it. In that's all it. the world of food, and we all have different diverse tastes and flavors that we like, your tongue can only taste those five things. So everything else comes through the olfactory, which is why we say when people go to a wine tasting, they know to slow down and use all their senses to engage. And they look at it first, and they swirl it, and then they smell it, and what's the aroma bouquet, and then they taste it, and they um, do the strapaggio method. I know, we'll that pause on that. Cool. And then they swallow it and then they think about the finish and they breathe out and then they just eat a piece of cheese mindlessly. So our goal is with these cheeses and chocolates today that you are intentionally evaluating those with a full sensory of experience. Like when you bite into it, a squeaky cheese curd is not a squeaky cheese curd if it doesn't squeak. So how can we engage all of our senses in it, um, slow down, breathe out while we're tasting because that's where we're going to get the full aroma. And so what that just did for me is I actually got We've, I've never done that with the Piedras de Luna. And I just got, when my nose was shut, I just got sweet. I got sweet all over my palate. Thousand percent, million percent. Cloyingly sweet. Then when I released. Unpleasantly sweet. Yeah, then when I released is when I got more rounded flavors. I got the nuttiness. The nutty came through just Instantly. like that. But I did not taste nuttiness. I got roasted. Mm-hmm. Came through from the roasted uh, cacao. Uh, anyway. That's why when you have a cold, you can't taste anything because your olfactory is blocked. So yeah. anyway, the point is we're going to, you try to use all those senses, but breathe out while we're eating it. Out the through time. the back of your nose. That's the key. Breathe out through the back of your nose and enjoy it, right? This is so cool. And my um, only other ask as we go is eat, I'm going to introduce the style of cheese first and just try to hold off. Then John will talk about the cheese itself and invite you to eat it because certain cheeses we want you to eat a certain way. And then we'll talk about the chocolate and how to put them together. But we're gonna go in that order. Um, but each time you eat the cheese first, because I know you have some crackers too, try to eat it naked. All right, I just said it, y'all. Eat that cheese naked or in the buff. But if you just smear it on your cracker and then you bite it, you're gonna taste cracker and you're not gonna taste that cheese. And so right now we're really trying to identify the nuance and the flavors of the cheese and the chocolate. And you won't get that if you're just eating crackers. But you then eat the crackers as filler and in-between bites and palate cleansers. So yeah? I would like, do you mind if I just talk a little bit about chocolate? We kind of set the stage for chocolate because we're going to do the styles of the cheeses and we're going to talk about the chocolates in general. But maybe just do a quick yeah. overview. If you didn't notice, this is unscripted with the Antonelli. Totally. And so we are on a journey John told me on our honeymoon um, that he wanted to quit his job and do something in cheese. And here we are over a decade later with an award-winning shop with a national commercial by Capital One, which is crazy, y'all. Um, and we are just here to have fun with food and to tell the story of good food makers. So, yes, honey. Now, all that means is we just have fun and we do it however we want. So, tell us. Yes, and feel, Take free, it away. feel free to correct me should you want okay. um, along the way. Oh, but, you know I will. So, what's there's there's cacao. And then there's cocoa, um, two very different um, words, almost the same spelling. So the the brief dis the brief difference: cacao is the raw material, the cacao tree, the cacao bean, the cacao pods, and cocoa is the um, after that has been processed through a particular couple of steps, you end up with cocoa. Some whether like it's cocoa powder what you or think cocoa of powder a or cocoa. a liquid, uh, it can be cocoa mass, which is more of a liquid, um, which is really what uh, the, the processed nibs, the meat 
of the seeds. And so that's the difference. So when you are talking about cocoa and cacao, you may hear Kendall and I use them. They're not actually interchangeable. They're very different things. And cacao trees grow 20 degrees north and south of the equator. That's, that's the line. So if you look on a map, they are right in that 20 degrees uh, a lot Central of those America, countries. Central America, Middle Belt, Africa, yeah. um, over into Southeast Asia. Hawaii has some. And so you get that band and, and they like hot, they like damp, and they like shade. And so basically uh, these pods, which are cylinders more or less, uh, you know, they're cool. Um, they have between 30 to 50 seeds that are inside of them. It's kind of this cool, beautiful structure. They're all very it's like similar. like reddish on the outside, about this big. It almost looks like a Christmas ornament. Yeah. About this big and inside is bright white. Mm -hmm. Bright yeah. white, the baba, the, the sort of this, uh, the fruitiness of it and uh, the, the flesh of it inside. And so what, basically twice a year, these uh, cacao pods are harvested from the trees. Um, and usually these, these farmers are, you know, they work their butts off and they work really hard. And um, over the many, many generations of uh, cacao, uh, depending on the cultures, this the cacao was often considered like gold. It was one of the highest valued um, raw materials on the planet, um, especially in Central America. And originating with the indigenous populations of Central America. Yeah, and, and really cacao was, you know, that is where cacao um, got its big like focus. A lot of Europeans had never experienced cacao and chocolate until uh, traveling to Central America. Um, colonization, and, colonization, but we won't go there. We, we won't do that. <laughs> That's but, a different topic. <laughs> so basically the, the pods get harvested um, and the, the seeds get, they get split. The seeds come out and they still have some of that baba on it. Um, and they go through like a seven to 14 day fermentation. So there's really two different ways to ferment chocolate, uh, cacao beans. Um, which is in a pile covered in banana leaves or sort of in these um, series of like boxes that they use also covered in banana leaves. And so, um, so they ferment for seven to 14 days and then those beans have to get dried. So they had been cleaned, then fermented, then dried so that they could transport. You don't want moisture because that can lead to mold. And so they have, to, they get you know, 14 days to 21 days of, of drying on these sort of wooden boards where they're getting raked. And it depends on where you go, but the drying matters, yep. right? And what we're gonna talk about for the most part in this tasting is a lot of bean to bar chocolate. And so that point now, those beans get transferred to a chocolatier. Um, and those chocolatiers really take the beans to the whole next level. So first they roast them uh, much like coffee beans, they roast them and it changes uh, the texture, the color, um, the aromas, uh, gives a lot of the flavor that you will get, then you start to get closer to what we know as chocolate. Uh, at that point, the seeds get um, cracked and winnowed and what that is doing is separating the, the seed pod from the cocoa, the nib, the actual meat of the seed. And those, that nib then gets ground down and conked um, and becomes cocoa mass, so more or less liquid cocoa. cocoa. Um, and then finally, that what they have to do is they, uh, they'll blend that with like sugar or milk powder or cocoa butter. So if it's a dark chocolate, you're gonna get um, uh, cocoa, um, uh, cocoa mass, cocoa butter, and sugar, and then if it's like, it's like a milk chocolate, they'll put in milk powder maybe. Uh, if it's a, um, a white chocolate, it'll be cocoa butter, sugar, milk powder. Um, some chocolatiers will use like soy lecithin and some other additives. So always look on the ingredient list because those create uh, textural um, cues that they're looking for that they might not have gotten out of the process. Um, we tend to work with producers that don't use that, but that is something that is common in chocolate chocolate making. Um, and then when they've got sort of this uh, bar shape that they're wanting, or the, te the, the combination of these ingredients where they really want them, then they will uh, temper and mold them. And tempering brings the cocoa, the pro the, all of the, um, the baseline, like the, the, the fats, the molecules, to the perfect temperature 
that they'll be sustainable for the longest. And uh, tempering is what gives it the like sheen, it gives it that texture, the smoothness. Um, and, and then it, when it cools, it cools in a mold. And that's how we get our chocolate bars. It's a cool And then they process. wrap them. And now if you look at all your beautiful chocolate bars, it's almost like, I, I don't even want to get into chocolate because yeah, each wrapping, the wrapping game is so high on it, everyone being a piece of art. And so that's nine different steps just to show you. Oftentimes we're talking about the same thing in cheese as we are in chocolate. But when you think of why is this really nice chocolate bar, this fancy chocolate bar, which we kind of want to demystify all of that. Um, but why is this $9.99 to $12.99 or above when I can get this Hershey's bar for $2.50? And now you know it's because artisans have their hands involved in every one of these processes. That's nine steps to go through. Um, somebody like a, a mass conglomerate chocolate bar, which there's there's no good and bad, they're just different. Somebody who does that um, are basically taking down a, um, they're buying cacao um, from all over and then stripping it of all of its um, specific elements and what they want of it and then putting it into this mass product that tastes the same every time. So if you're ever wondering you know, what are the, some of the differences in it, it's that um, intentional step-by-step, -step, hands involved in the process, labor of love from beginning to end that's in artisanal chocolate. And so. this is an artisanal video and sometimes, <laughs> uh, sometimes one of us has to stand up. We didn't leave you. I just had to stand up for a second. So. Okay, so thank you, John. Like harvesting, so cool. fermenting, drying, roasting, cracking and winnowing, um, grinding and conking, tempering, molding, molding wrapping, wrapping eating. eating. Here we go. Cheese number one. All right. So there's so many ways to classify cheese. We have a whole cheese 101 tasting box, and it has seven different types of pairings from chocolate to charcuterie to honey to everything in between. But the generic here, because I'll leave that for the, yeah. the bigger in-depth version, are your fresh cheeses. Um, so this is how we taught ourselves when we first quit those jobs on that honeymoon and decided to open a cheese shop. Um, fresh cheeses like mozzarella, ricotta, fromage blanc, a fresh chev or goat's milk are just um, meant to be eaten. You can eat them the day they're made. They're meant to be eaten within a couple weeks or they can last longer due to modern conventions and industrial food packaging. Um, but they are often bright white, no matter what type of milk it's made with. Because if you look on your plate, there are different colors. There's bright white, there's ivory. Well, goat's milk can process the beta carotenes in grass. So their cheeses will always be bright white, no matter the age. Sheep to a lesser extent and cows cannot. So cow's milk cheeses will always present as a little more yellow or straw hued. So fresh cheeses though are always bright white. They really don't have any smell. If they do, they smell very lactic, like milk or like You can yogurt. go ahead and eat this one, y'all. Yeah, and go ahead and use have your a, fingers if you want. A bite of this one. Um, and mm. really people often use them as cooking ingredient cheeses, but they're showstoppers uh, and they can be showstoppers. So this one is, it's very rare to find a fresh sheep's milk cheese. Sheep's, sheep's, sheep. <laughs> Sheep. <laughs> I showed sheep growing up, and uh, you think I could say that um, in 4-H. Okay. That's what it is. Sheep have the shortest lactation cycle. It is the most expensive to make sheep milk cheese. They yield the least amount of milk. And so for numerous reasons, um, this is pretty rare to see fresh sheep milk cheese when you can, and you see any sheep milk producer support them. But this is Wooly Wooly, and this is from Mitica out of Spain, made in Humilla. Yeah, so it? this is... Uh, uh, Michelle Buster of Forever, uh, this company, mm, so founded this import company with a partner, and they go to you know Spain, Mediterranean, Spain, Italy, and source these ridiculous cheeses. So this is their first from uh, Humia, um, and again, it's uh, happiness on the palate. So you, with sheep's milk, you're gonna get this real richness. They're sweet, mildly sheepy flavors, just mild. Um, maybe a hint of lanolin, but not gamey. But not all. gamey. Uh, it's fluffy. Uh, we like to eat this with like lox, you on know, a bagel, basically or toast. replace cream cheese. You can replace yogurt. Sheep's milk is the richest and the fattiest, so you can really taste that richness as it just coats your palate. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so it's awesome, and we've got a great pairing with it today. I'm really excited. This is 73% dark Ghana okay. chocolate. Okay. Try to just taste your chocolate first. I was already going to dive in for my pairing. So okay. this the the 73% signifies. Um, how much of the content of the bar is the cocoa mass, the, 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 the chocolate 
part. Um, and no. it does not always mean the higher percentage means it tastes darker. Um, our friend Sean Espinosi taught yeah. us that. That oftentimes you can kind of correlate that, but really that all depends on terroir and where those beans are sourced and how it's made. Yeah, and the, the chocolate maker has this level of opportunity to say, okay, I think this cocoa bean or this cacao bean represents best at 69%, meaning that the other 31% is made of sugar and um, cocoa butter. Or I think this uh, cacao bean rep flavors are represented best at 75%. And so they get to make an, a, a choice here. It's science and art. Like, mm -hmm. you know, what is the science and what does the flavor come out to be? And so they get to play with it. And so this is two Pan-African sisters in Ghana, um, Kimberly and Priscilla. They are amazing. We, we were introduced to them uh, in 2020 and started a relationship. We started uh, DHLing chocolate directly from Ghana. Um, and uh, their focus is uh, Ghana is in that band, that 20 degrees north-south of the equator. And they, they have some of the best cacao um, in the in the world but most of those uh seeds that dry get sent to places like switzerland and incorporated in the large-scale chocolate making and so that they really wanted to do is bring bean to bar chocolate into ghana and and create a reflection of the culture that they that they know and love and in fact 57 chocolate is named after the year of ghana's independence in yeah. 1957. totally and so their mission really is to live that revolutionary spirit and create these really wonderful dark chocolate bars. We currently carry this 73% dark. Um, and, and we're one of the only like three or four people for, in the nation doing bringing this chocolate into the United States. Um, so mm -hmm. it is important for us to support that, local though. and close when we can, but it's also important to us to tell the stories of these producers and meet them where they're at. Mm -hmm. And we love this story of not only supporting these sisters, but helping them support and protect their own local resources and make a chocolate that expresses Ghana and is Ghana. Yeah. And I love that citrus finish to yeah. that chocolate. What's funny is Almost the cheese orange. is tangy. So when I had the perception after I ate the cheese, when I just ate the chocolate, I had the perception that it tastes sweeter than it does. <laughs> then when I put the cheese on top of the chocolate, then I felt like I got a more balanced flavor profile because yeah. it wasn't one following the other. And yeah, I got that citrus finish. I should have met, we should have mentioned, I just went straight into the pairing. Definitely try the chocolate on its own. The flavors are so nuanced and so balanced. You can find four, five, six things. Make sure you're breathing out. There's something When amazing. you have the time letting these chocolates kind of melt on your palate and your tongue, and then you can remember sweet, salt, bitter, sour mommy, and you can, and breathing out, you can get more of that expression across it too. Yeah. Because we're cheese people, you're kind of pal coating your palate with cheese when you eat it first, but we, we're cheese That's, forward. We're cheese, we're yeah. cheese forward. Um, so there's uh, there's three three types of chocolate that we're going to talk about throughout the course of the tasting. Single origin, which we just had. Uh, infused, which has you know, uh, added flavors. Um, and then confections, which are more like candy bars. So uh, we're going to kind of hit a combination of those types of things um, throughout the course of this tasting. Okay. want to cleanse our palate and uh, get ready to the next one? Oh, do you want me to cleanse my palate? With or drink wine? I'm going to drink wine. All right. I hope it's certainly you... not a palate cleanser, but it's a mama's having fun and cheese yeah. and chocolate night. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed pairing number one. It is time for number two. Okay, your second style of cheeses are your bloomy rinds. So bloomy rinds most famously are brie and camembert, but you always know them because they have this thin white skin on them all the way around. That is called the rind. Right under that area is called the cream line, and then you have the inner paste. What this mold does on the outside is, yes, this is a mold. It derives from penicillium camemberti, and it's breaking down the proteins as this cheese ages. So you know how when you cut into a brie, it typically is really creamy. Um, that's because those proteins have broken down all due to that um, mold development and made it a creamier cheese. If you cut into that brie when it was really young, it would be chalky in the inside. And it's not bad, it's just not fully ripened. Um, so. Uh, the flavor profile of these is often really vegetal, so broccoli, or almost broccoli cheese soup sometimes, um, asparagus, cauliflower, sometimes a little bit of mushroomy or peat moss. Um, so that's the flavor profile often in these cheeses. 
Um, and today we're going with Petite Creme from Marin French um, out of California. They've been, they've been making cheese since 1865, making them the longest continually operating cheese maker in the United States, which is so cool. And I want to show you those textures. You can see I have more of an inner, a little bit of an inner chalky paste and then a cream lime and then that rind. So as John tells you about it, eat that inner piece first just to try it, then get the cream line and then get a bite with the rind. Okay, so they are sourcing now uh, uh, milk from within 15 miles of their cheese making uh, plant. Uh, this petite creme is small format, it's only about four ounces. So you got the whole wheel, uh, which is cool. So um, you get to uh, experience your very own moment because each wheel of cheese tastes slightly different. Um, so what I'm eating is different than what you're eating. And so it's got a creamy uh, paste, sweet flavor, uh, that rind gives us just a nice little hint of texture. Uh, it's won a silver award at the World Food uh, World Cheese Championships. Uh, so it's a really standout cheese, and um, I love the the variety of textures. And when we play with chocolate uh, and a cheese like this, um, what we were going for, uh, at least when we made these selections, was that you know creamy, rich, buttery notes of this cow's milk um, flowing through and pairing it with an infusion bar and, or, uh, or inclusion bar. Just before we do that, people often ask, should we eat the rind? And we say, a rind is a terrible thing to waste. Um, Be kind to your rind. No rind left behind. And all that is to say is, yes, eat the rind. It is an important part of the cheese. If you like it, keep eating it. If you don't, don't eat it. Life is too short. Um, all rinds have to be edible to be sold in the United States, even wax rinds. So wax rinds aren't really meant to be eaten, but they will not hurt you. But other ones, you're gonna find different flavors and nuance, and especially natural rinds, those that look like they have kind of dirt on the outside, those go great with chocolate and red wines. Um, so just, yes, eat the rind. And when I eat the rind, what I got this time, and I know you haven't gotten to eat it, was I actually got a little bit of artichoke. So I didn't taste it as much when I didn't have the rind in it, but when I had the rind with it, I got this flavor of artichoke. Not necessarily like pickled mm. artichokes, but like cooked artichokes. Dang. Usually he comes up with the descriptors, wow. but well, did you get that? Yeah, totally. Okay. That's awesome. So I just wanted to say it because I was proud that I my brain got there. You Sometimes you're it. like, I know that taste, I know that taste, but you can't get there. And people often ask us how we do that. And it literally is just sitting and talking about our food all, all the, time. the time. Where those people at dinner are like, what's that flavor? What's that flavor? Yeah. So now yeah, you know. Okay, so, so go back to it. What's that food. flavor? So this chocolate is special. This is um, Hershit and uh, Elliot. Um, our amazing chocolatiers based in Austin, Texas. Elliot was one of our uh, previous team members and went on to create this chocolate brand. Uh, Madhu is the name of Arshit's mom. Um, and then the word translates to sort of sweet or honey. Um, and they focus on really creative flavors um, that come from his upbringing, so Indian flavors. And so uh, this one is vanilla and fennel. This is super fun. Fennel is one of my all-time favorite flavors. You I get it in the notes. I haven't tried this chocolate in a while, and what I'm loving about it is, I remembered vanilla, vanilla fennel, and I thought that that would be aggressively there, and instead it's really subtle and really beautiful, meaning that you still get the chocolate, the cocoa first, but then I barely get that fennel there. Uh, the fennel's just that. And it's really as I'm breathing out. Like, like aroma, almost. Yeah. yeah, and vanilla doesn't, this is a great example, of vanilla doesn't mean sweet. Like we often associate like vanilla ice cream. So you think of it as sweet. And instead, this is just the flavor of vanilla itself, but without all that extra residual sugar. Paired with that artichoke note. Mm. Oh, it's like a... Okay, I'm going together. Almost like a mole, like a rich um, enchilada. I mean, it's like amazing. Gosh, that's in. so cool. All right, yeah. you keep talking while I... Well, you can go on to number well, three. Oh, here. Okay, I'll put this down and do number three. <laughs> you want to do number three? Yeah. Okay. We're making, it's hard for us to eat and talk at the same time. We're making time. great time. I'm okay. feeling so good right now. This chocolate tastes great. Um, but the, I, I love what I love about that example of an infusion is that, um, or flavoring, if you will, as we often don't carry a lot of flavored cheeses either. And it's because sometimes that's just masking poor quality milk. 
Um, like if you have a hot pepper cheese, it's fun to eat it. It's just, you're not tasting the artisanal nature of all the labor that went into it. And I feel the same with chocolate. I still love to eat those. You just can't actually taste, if you're a chocolate lover, you can't taste the chocolate. And this is just chocolate forward all the way and then just accentuated with that yeah. little bit of fennel vanilla. It was really beautiful. Okay. And they are another bean to bar company. So bean to bar means that the chocolatier gets the beans um, directly and does all of those steps, roast, winnow, all of those things until they make the I mean, very other common practice is to buy pre-made cocoa mass. And a and lot just, of chocolatiers do this. Yeah, just remelt it and temper it and move and create a bar. But uh, most of the chocolatiers we work with are in fact starting with a bean and taking it from there. So it just requires more skills. You not drink wine, I'm gonna do a palate cleanse. We're on the uh, ch uh, cheese number three. Cheers, y'all. Okay, cheese number three, my favorite style of cheeses are wash drying cheeses. Wash drying cheeses get that name because they wash them in a brine solution or salt water solution. It can also be wine, beer, marked begonia. Um, usually on the outside, it has this sort of sunset color hue, as you can see. So reddish, orangish, pinkish, sometimes a little bit wet. Oftentimes, they're really stinky. Um, sometimes they taste just as stinky on your palate as they smell. But other, most of the time, um, they don't taste as stinky. Um, this one is sort of a softball of my brain because it's not one of the most pungent wash drying cheeses. And this tradition comes from Trappist and Benedictine monks who during Lenten months would wash their cheeses that are aging down in the cellars with their beers. And oftentimes the flavor results in something that's hearty, it's bacony, it's woodsy. And so it feels like your steak on a plate when it's not, it's, it's just cheese, um, just cheese. Okay, so today we are trying Quadrilla di Bufala. Definitely eat the inner bite first and then try bite it with the rind. This may be a rind that you don't enjoy as much or it depends on what I'm drinking with it. I'm gonna love it with this red wine. But we have gone from sheep's milk, which is rich and nutty, to cow's milk, which is grassy and buttery, to now water buffalo milk, which we often say has this like wet hay tanginess to it. Um, Quadrello Portoni. Um, Quattro Portoni. Oh, yeah, this is Quadrello di Bufala from Quattro Portoni in Lombardy, Italy. Um, it's a brothers that produce it and it's a water buffalo milk cheese. So it's a, it's one I, of our- I'm trying to hold back because John is already supposed to be nope. speaking and I just kept going. I think you did great. It's one of our all time favoritest cheeses. Just enjoy it. Water buffalo milk aged in the style of Taleggio. It's mm. incredible. And what we paired with Wait, it, what it buttery- like melt on your mouth, yeah. Bruno, Cheesemaker hosted us and our kids there. It was an amazing experience. Yeah. Okay, now- Buttery, you yeasty, tastes like like really good bread with butter already on it, so good. And so the chocolate that we paired with it is Doc Lock 70%. This comes from Vietnam, um, from a company called Maru. Um, we were the very first company in the United States mm -hmm. to bring Maru onto our shelf. So we are, have a very intimate, long relationship with Dang, them. Dang, that tastes good right now. Um, and Doc Lock, uh, they do, um, Basically, they source um, a cacao from different regions of Vietnam and then do the bean to bar process there. And so this comes, Dak Lok is one of those areas in central Vietnam. It's known, uh, it's really known for its pepper cultivation. So these cacao trees are uh, kind of grow amidst 30,000 pepper uh, vines and trees in that province. Um, it's the world's largest, uh, Vietnam's the world's largest exporter of peppers. So that, and there's some coffee uh, tr uh, trees. There's, it's an amazing um, place for growing these types of foods. Um, and so the taste on this, you may end up experiencing a little pepper. I don't know, we're about to find out. When you, I don't know if it's the power of suggestion, but as you said pepper, I get more like, a red pepper, like the sweetness and fruitiness of a red bell pepper or a yellow bell pepper. Um, mm, totally good. Wow. Not pepper as in spicy. Not pepper as in spicy, pepper as in... Like white pepper, sometimes a white pepper mm -hmm. in a dish, um, as in the, the flavor of the spice, a little bit of that cashew, but I'm also getting like rum raisin or something like a... I just love Maru. I just, the, yeah. the flavors that they develop in their cocoa, it's just amazing. I could sit down with 10 of these bars. Yes. I also like the, the thinness of it. 
you know, um, the, the size of the bar, you're getting one of the mini bars, um, is uh, it's a nice thin sort of snap to it rather than a thing. big bite. And, and it so, shows you how texture can play a difference. To me, it's like, you know how soup tastes different when you eat it with a spoon than when you drink it, but it's the, literally the same soup, but it's texturally, it's the mouthfeel that you get as a different experience. I enjoyed this one after the first two because it flaked more. It flaked it, more, it had like a higher pitch when it cracked in your mouth. And so that was one of the things that we were going for when we selected this pairing and this particular product of, of Maru. So try all their other stuff. They, uh, they have a handful of other bars that are all single, uh, single varietal, single origin. Um, and it really showcases what Vietnam can produce. It's pretty spectacular. All right. We like to take pause each time. <sighs> all right. Cheese okay, number four. cheese number four. Um, we are moving to semi-soft, firm, and hard. And now depending on which wheel you get, artisanal cheese can vary from batch to batch and season to season. But the quickie here is what, what affects the texture of it? Really two things, how they treat the curds. So the process of making cheese is separating the curds from the solids, or the curds, um, Little Miss Muffet sat on her tuffet eating her curds and whey. The liquids from the solids, separating your proteins and your whey. Um, so you have your vat of milk, you inoculate it, or you pour in a little bit of cultures to help determine is it gonna grow up to be a cheddar or a gouda. You put in a little rennet, and that's what naturally coagulates it. So it changes it in consistency from milk or liquid milk to more like flan custard. You cut your curds, you scoop out your curds, and you put them in a form, and basically that's how you have your cheese mold. Well, if you want to maintain moisture because you want a good melter, a semi-soft cheese is great for grilled cheese, mac and cheese, fondue. If you want a good melter, you need to maintain that moisture. You leave those curds big and plump as you scoop them up and put them in the hoops, and you're trying to treat them gently so they don't lose moisture. And you're not gonna age them as long because the longer you age a cheese, the more moisture it loses. But if you know you wanna make an aged cheese like a Parmigiano Reggiano, you're gonna cut those curds really small, expel as much moisture as you can, scoop those curds out. Then once you have them over here and you have your shake, you're even gonna press it and expel more and more way out because moisture, as we talked about in the process of drying out cacao, moisture is not your friend as you're trying to ferment and age something long-term. So you need to get that moisture out of there. So what affects semi-soft, firm, and hard? It's how you treated the curds when you made the cheese and then what's the age of it. Um, Let's dive in with this one. This is Chandoka. Um, this is a mix, our first mixed milk cheese. So it's goat and cow. Um, it's our first goat, I think. So goat's yeah. milk cheese is bright and minerally and acidic and citrusy and zesty and tangy. And then you're mixing it with that buttery grassiness of the cow's milk. This is from LeClaire Farms in Malone, Wisconsin from Larry, Larry and, and Clara, Clara Hedrich. So they've been doing this since the late 70s. Um, now they have almost 400 goats that they're milking year round. Um, and Shandoka is, you know, Wisconsin is really known for block cheddars, those long logs, mm. blocks. Um, and so what they're playing with, which I think is fun, is mixed milk. It's sort of new to this country. Um, and this is, there's artistry around it. It's um, how much goat milk per vat versus cow's milk, right? They are making a choice because what they've done is they've tested over and over again to find the flavors that make the most sense for the milks that they have access to. Um, and so Shandoka is a beautiful example of a classic block cheddar with a new twist on it. And so you can see the curds have been pressed together. When you break it apart, you can almost see it looks like string, like string cheese has been squished together. Um, but definitely enjoy it. Mm, smell it. I love this cheese. I can eat this cheese all the time. Good acid, good salt. When I bit into it, I immediately got the acid. And so what does that mean? Sometimes when we hear acid, like, oh, I've got acid. That, that's the bad side of it. That's not what we're talking about here. When we talk about acid in terms of wine or cheese, it's or chocolate or anything, it's that it produces saliva on the sides of your mouth. So it almost is making you salivate. It's bringing, um, that acid is bringing moisture into your mouth so that's what's amazing about this cheese and we pair this i'm excited it's actually crazy because this chocolate is just next to my cheese i could already taste the chocolate on it but this is another inclusion bar mm. um the flavoring new Uga to the new to the business just for this plate uganda orange zest from yep. beyond good so beyond good is a chocolatier that 
really started by focusing on Madagascar cacao. And so Madagascar, again, has one of the richest sources of uh, wildlife vegetation on the planet. And it, it has incredible um, uh, cacao. Now, the way that this company works with their farmers is they really try to support back all the way to the people that are producing the raw material um, so that they can invest back in. It's sort of a circular relationship, right? Um, and where they both build each other up. Um, now, Uganda is new to Beyond Good. So they just really started uh, stretching their legs into the Uganda, um, uh, country of Uganda, because they fell in love with the distinct flavors of the, the, the cocoa that is coming from there. Um, there it's very important in, uh, to mention, because it's very important to them, that as of right now, they haven't had enough time to develop a proprietary supply chain in Uganda. So this is more of a gener generic purchase of cacao and cocoa. Um, but their goal is in a handful of years, they've helped create manufacturing facilities for their products in Uganda and that they've helped farmers. And then in a handful of years, those farmers can buy new trucks because of the, the funds that they're helping create. So you can still say it's single origin to Uganda but there's a difference even in single estate like from one producer in this one area which is similar to wine too mm -hmm. um mm. let this chocolate melt all the way down on your palate and you're left with those little pieces of orange zest which i freaking love and as i already told you in goat's milk cheeses you often get citrus and so i love that play of the orange zest with the goat's milk in this chandoka um and they're just like hey citrus hey citrus we did it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cheers. Awesome. All okay. Right. Cheese number five. We're rolling, y'all. So excited for a carpenter's wheel. Our firm cheese. We are going to Firefly Farms, a farmstead cheese maker in Maryland with Mike Coke and Pablo. Yeah. Um, and take, so we're, we're comparing it goats and cow's milk to now goat's milk cheese. Yeah, totally. So this is awesome. So they founded their dairy in 2002 in Maryland, um, and they work with um, dairy folks within a 30 mile radius of the creamery to get the best possible milk that they can get. Um, and then they partner with a company in Brooklyn called Crown Finish Caves. And Crown Finish Caves um, is awesome. They're this really cool company. They found a abandoned brewery in Brooklyn that had these beer aging caves underneath the street level. Um, and it turns out that those, those environments were kind of perfect for aging cheese. So they partner with the best creameries around the country to bring in their products and age them in special ways to create these unique flavors. So this has um, really beautiful ambient mold on the exterior that you can see. So I probably um, give a the rind, after you've tried to paste, give the rind a bite too. Yeah, and this just amazing flavor profile. And part of what's interesting about this cheese is because we're eating so many sweet things, the acid actually stands out quite a bit more now than say when we um, use this cheese and other tastings. We're yeah, I'm feeling a little bit um, of a histamine, like a little bit of spiciness on my tongue, yeah. but I think it's just because Quickly. it's in contrast to all the other sweet all things we talked about. And speaking of contrast, when we're doing pairings, we look for complementary flavors that work well together. So for instance, on some of the others we've done acid with acid. This one is a contrasting flavor combination. And so we are going full on with our sweet confection bar here. So for anybody who's like, I don't know if single origin bean to bar, really nice chocolates mm -hmm. are, if I'm appreciating them. If you just like full on sweet indulgence, I do, yeah. um, this is a pairing for you. Butter caramel bar from Zotter USA. So this it is like- It melts in your mouth. Um, it's a pretty different mm -hmm. approach. It's uh, it's like thin layers just over and over again, layered, 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 layered into this very delicate bar. And what we have is a uh, melted caramel, a layer of praline, and then caramel crisps layered into the middle of just this very delicate chocolate on the outside. Um, and so you're getting this- So we took a little few liberties here. Yeah, well. well it's chocolate. There's it's still, still people would still call this a chocolate bar. Yeah. And it's still part of our instructional on the difference between um, a full mm. chocolate bar, a single origin, an inclusion bar, or a confection. Mm. These are like hand scooped because they're so delicate. 
And they, as you can tell, just melt in your fingertips. I kind of love the way the acid of that carpenter's mm -hmm. wheel brought forward a um, lot more of the um, almost burnt aspect of the caramel, like mm. that, that almost the far side of roasted. Mm -hmm. And then I love this firmer, drier texture with that creaminess of this. Mm. Okay, cheers. That was awesome. Another great one. All right. Cheese number six, y'all. Perfect. We are moving to our hard cheese. Hard cheeses are not great melters. Um, they're often known for their salt content. Um, and this one specifically, we're going to Dalmatinat. Yep. Did I do it right? Dalmatinat. Closer. I don't know. From um, Pasky Sirana from Croatia. Yeah, so what makes this cheese maker cool? Pasky Sir is this amazing cheese that they've been making for a really long time. Nice. That's one best cheese in the world a couple times. It it's like just nuts. heavenly. And it, that one is 100% sheep milk uh, with Pog sheep from the Isle of Pog. Um, and what they're doing here is they're taking a blend. They're doing 90% cow's milk, 10% sheep's milk. Again, playing with that artistry mm. of, of cheese making and sort of using a very similar um, uh, process to create this Dalmatinets. Um, it, it was a winner of a Super Gold uh, at the World Cheese Awards in 2014. It's a, only their second cheese that they've made. So they've had a number one in the world and they've had a Super Gold winner. These, these folks just know how to make great cheese. Um, Pog is this sort of like super rocky island just off the coast, very close to the coast. And all that the rockiness of it forces like the vegetation to work a little bit more harder, be a little bit rougher. And then the sheep just go to town and love it. And that really impacts the final flavor profile of the milk in a beautiful way. And because we know that sheep's milk is hard to source and not necessarily always available. This is a mixed milk cheese. You're getting the richness of that sheep's milk. And then they source some cow's milk from the mainland of Croatia um, to fill it out and add that butteriness to it. I love, this is just an easy table munching cheese. If I wasn't even doing chocolate, I would drink this all day. I would drink my big red wine all day long with an aged sheep's milk cheese. It really goes beautifully together. Um, and we are specifically, oh, if you like crunchies mm -hmm. and cheese, those are tyrosine crystals. It's a product of aging the cheese, um, the proteins breaking down. And the only last thing I wanted to say here is what affects the flavor of a cheese? We've talked about it all by now, but just to wrap it all up, um, it's what's the species? Cow, goat, sheep, water buffalo, yak, camel, etc. What is the breed of that species? So the breed matters. Holstein milk is different from Jersey or Montbelliard milk of a cow. Um, and then lastly, what season is it? Where is that animal at in its lactation cycle? And what is the animal eating at that time of year? All of those things are the main things that will go into impacting the base ingredients, that milk quality. What does the milk taste like? Because good milk Great milk makes great cheese. Um, and really a cheesemaker's job is to showcase, an artisanal cheesemaker's job is to showcase that great milk and to not fuss with it and show it at its best. I okay. love that cheese. And we've got this paired with Itty Bitty Bars from Sean Askinosi. You're so, in Tanzania today, I took your wrapper Oh, you off. did. So mm -hmm. the, on the back of your wrapper, it'll say what origin. He does single, what, Sean was one of the very first Single origin bean to bar producer. He's not much older than us, but I call him the grandfather yeah. of bean to bar chocolate in the United States. He, would, he was the first one to do the whole cycle of actually profit sharing back to the farmers that were creating the cacao for him or harvesting the cacao for him. So each of these bars will taste slightly different. So if each you might want to share amongst your group so you can all try Ecuador or Tanzania. There's a couple different Philippines sometimes shows up. So, so really we're showcasing that like dark chocolate, single origin with bean the, to bar. yeah, bean to bar with this age, saltier, grassy cheese. Yep. Um, to me, this is the earthy combination. This is like earth and soil and dirt. We haven't talked about terroir at all, terroir at all. Terroir is the specificity of place. It's that if I try to make this cheese or this chocolate, with all the exact same ingredients in a different place, it would never taste the same because you can't replicate the climate and the soil and the angle of the sun at a certain day on this plant. And so it makes, why is something special from where it comes from? And that's the concept of terroir. So this is my like terroir pairing in a 
bite. Can I have your water, my love? Perfect. Fine. Thank you. Okay. Cheers. Another great moment, y'all. Cheers. I guess you don't think I'm drinking any water over here. Okay. Nope. Um, You've got the wine, my dear. Last up is our blue cheese. So if we go back to having our liquid vat of milk, you inoculate blue cheese with a blue mold that derives from penicillin Roquefort. Roquefort being one of the first blue cheeses we know about. Um, and then later you have your, your wheel of cheese and you go and you pierce it with needles and you just press them down. Now, some people think you're injecting blue mold into there, but you're not. You're literally just piercing the cheese and allowing oxygen to hit that mold. And because that mold is aerobic, that's what allows it to vein or grow these colors. We call it blue veins and green veins and yellow veins. So you may have had a blue cheese before and you never knew it because it wasn't pierced, um, but that mold was still present in there. Um, they can be cool and calming. They don't always have to be aggressive and, and big and hot on your palate. Um, so give blue cheeses the gam the runaround. Uh, if it's too much for you, sometimes put honey on it or something like that. I did want to note as we taste this cheese, Asher Blue from Sweetgrass Dairy of Georgia, this is our first and only raw milk cheese of the night. So we can sell raw milk cheese in the United States as long as it's aged over 60 days. Um, so just noting that sometimes when you cook milk, depending on how you treat it, you can kill off some of that flavor that we were talking about. So in this case, you're getting more of an expression, you're getting more opportunity to taste what that raw milk tastes like. All right, take us um, back so to Georgia. Georgia has a very beautiful, mild climate. So these cows get to graze all year round. So uh, Jeremy and Jessica Little focus on intensive grazing management, which means that every 12 hours, the cows are transitioned onto a different pasture so that the soil doesn't get compacted too much, the grasses don't get killed, um, the, um, and the, the animals can fertilize the ground. So there's a whole benefit to this ecosystem that they're creating. And uh, Jessica really focuses on that. And then Jeremy focuses on the cheese. Um, and he's a, uh, he was a chef for a long time. So he tries to create cheeses that chefs can play with and use. And Asher Blue is his natural rinded blue cheese. Um, it you can be- You taste it, it tastes like cave. It has, um, it in could, a good way, dirt, but like yeah, more like soil. soil. Like they're trying to showcase sort of um, peppery, minerality uh, soil. Like that, they're so proud of the soil. And this cheese can actually sort of bring some of that farm to our plate, which and is really fun. I would call really this a pretty fun. big blue cheese. Yeah. This has got a pretty strong flavor. Big bite, big bite. Um, it can be pep uh, spicy, peppery. A little um, bit mushroomy flavor profile on it. Yeah, and we just love uh, Sweetgrass Dairy. They're amazing people. We did a behind the scenes with them tasting last year. So go to our YouTube channel. You can check out um, their interview with their videos and some of their facilities. Um, and then we paired it with one of my all time favorite treats. This is John's road snack for when we're on a car trip only it only lasts like, like 10 minutes, minutes right a cup of these so this is uh piedras de lunas it's chocolate covered uh cashews, cashews. made by our friends in spain a um mm. they are they make our marcona almonds our cuicos mm. and this is just one of my all-time cashews are a sweet nut to begin with and then you layer on the beautiful cocoa uh <coughs> excuse me uh cocoa butter and you'll end up um, with this, just like, like, there's like a little bit of sea salt mixed in mm -hmm. there. Some little crunchies. Yeah, it's just like a perfect single bite. And and clearly we're going for that contrasting here with the sweetness of these Piedras de Luna with the cheese. And what I think I but would also do- also that crunchy texture to it. On this tasting, what I think I do is have the cocoa, uh, the chocolate covered cashew first, let it coat your palate, and then come in with the cheese afterwards. Mm. So we have just done a micro cheese 101, but an exploration of cheese flavors and chocolate, how chocolate is made and chocolate flavors. I hope you'll provide us with some feedback on what your favorite combinations were. Go back and mix and match. And definitely every one of these chocolates des deserves to be enjoyed in their own right, even without cheese, dare I say it, um, to just get that full expression of it. So. We hope you had fun with us. We have fun eating. So thank you for paying us to do it or whoever gifted this to you. And like we said, we have some other classes and then we'll release a whole new one of these in a couple months. Um, we're on a mission to do good, eat good. For us, that means 
sourcing from these makers who make their foods in a way that is not only sustainable, but regenerative, so it's good for the land. Uh, they treat their animals humanely, their teams ethically. They make delicious products. Um, and then in turn, when people spend their hard-earned dollar with us, we try to do all the same, take care of our team, our community. We have a robust give back philanthropy program and a charitable cheese cause every month. Um, and that's all what we call part of the do good, eat good cycle. It is hard as a small business to stay in business. So thank you, because literally by you watching this, you are helping us out. If we've done a good job, please let us know. We would love to share it with the team and with the makers that we're proud to represent. Um, and definitely don't keep us a secret. We're, we're hustling, we're trying to stay here. But thank you for being a part of this do good, eat good cycle and all of our passion with purpose and our core principles to be juggernauts of awesome, to live with family first and always in our brain, to improve every day. Um, and to be true to ourselves and to others. Which means showing up as we are to you, flaws and all. Just like that. Just having fun over food. So with that, thanks for building community and letting us spread joy through trees and chocolate one bite at a time. Amazing. Cheers, y'all. Cheers, y'all. Thanks.